Hello, Gov Seekers. Welcome. Episode 156. Thank you to AN11THR100 or whatever for the keep fighting. Thank you so much. We will keep fighting every day. Uh, we got a rock solid uh, episode. Here's my government secrets mug. Mmm. Available only uh, at patreon.com slash government secrets. All right. What else do we got going on? Uh, let me take that off. A lot, of things, a lot of things are getting hot here. All right. Yeah, thank you for watching on my YouTube and Lee's YouTube. And of course, over on Rockfin. Uh, where are we at? All right. Let's do it. The curl's getting really gamey. The curl's getting really long and weird. All right. It's the Florida Keys. <laughs> All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for Government Secrets, episode 156, with the two most censored comedians in America, Lee Camp and Graham Hill. <laughs> <clears throat> wow, you started this one with a real, like, mellow Bob Ross on a sunny day kind of vibe. I didn't know. I didn't know I was walking into that. I, Wow, you gave me a tingly down below. That was beautiful. That was really nice. <laughs> A tingly down below. That's what, when I woke up this morning, I said, God, I hope I give Lee a tingly down below. That's <laughs> did you just, did you just walk straight out of like the hot yoga class? <laughs> um, I did do hot yoga today, Lee. If you, if that's, <laughs> um, I didn't come oh, sorry to out you. I did do hot yoga today. Um, and uh, somebody told me to put a tack in my curl in the comment section. That's like such. <laughs> no, no, he's sticking with duct tape. Duct tape for the curl. I don't know. You're Mr. Tack, Lee. You're Mr. Tacks fix everything. So I'll just put one in my forehead because you know everything. <laughs> he's just sitting here bleeding down the middle of his head going, Lee's always right. Listen to Lee. See, Lee, this is what we do. Oh, where, where he, he came from? in with such a mellow Bob Ross vibe and five minutes in, he's stabbing a tack into his forehead. And you know, <laughs> that's the influence I have. 11 minutes in. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to go Bob Ross vibe. You're you've got it nice and tight today, buddy. You, you, well, you know what, you know what this is? It looks nice and tight. This is, Three minutes before we started, it was like full Jufro, Bob Ross. It was full Bob Ross craziness. And then I had to just like wet it and just pull it back because there was no other option. It was all, all was lost, <laughs> you know. Did you duct tape it in the back? Is it at least or did you? Axe, baby. <laughs> oh, sweet, 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 sweet. Yeah. Um, we've got two exciting episodes, uh, two exciting uh, segments. I got to say mine, actually, we should probably end on mine because mine actually has a little bit of an upbeat. I'm, I'm fine with that, but I will say, I think mine's going to be enjoyable. I don't like, I might mention murder a couple of times, but there's not like almost nobody dies in this one. Well, mine... Wow, Ecuadorian taco. I love you. Boom. Look at you. Thank you, Ecuadorian taco. Whoops. We've just out, we out clicked each other. Out clicked um, each other, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, people die in mine. That's people die, people die in mine. <laughs> mine takes place in the Vietnam War. So yeah. Um it's 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 all right. As as long as you can uh, you know leave, leave us laughing, leave us dancing, then we'll be fine. <laughs> The CIA Green Berets in the Vietnam War. If we're not laughing and dancing after those three things, I don't know what we're doing as, anymore. 
as as Emma Goldman said, uh, a genocide with the Green Berets that doesn't involve dancing is not one I want to be involved in. Um, dance with the Green Berets and the CIA in Vietnam like nobody's watching. That's my slogan. That's what I always said. You know, that's how I live my life. You know, dance like no one's watching, especially if it's with Green Berets and the CIA in Vietnam. Oh, Br Bruce is going to get a shout out because he said, seriously, you only mentioned the money, the money uh, comments. Well, there you go, Bruce. I just totally flummoxed your whole thesis. Yeah. Boom. But yeah, I mean, we do only mention the yeah, money. Just, once. I just kinda... ruined your thesis statement. <laughs> I mean, we do have bills to pay, Bruce. So yeah. Yeah, that's the point. Um, and uh, but we did let a, the squeaky wheel get some grease. <laughs> Always. I like to I like to feed the trolls so much that they burst, that they just keel over and have to spend the evening vomiting. Like when a mosquito lands on your bicep and you flex to watch it explode. Is that kind of what you Oh, that's perfect. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think that's perfect. the first time you've ever heard anybody talk or do that before. <laughs> Flexing wall. All the mosquito goes to town. Yeah, that's what we did with your kids. We'd let them land, and then we'd flex the like the th and watch the mosquito explode. I don't even know what you're talking about. This, this what? This is lunacy. You didn't run you, a torture you, program you, for mosquitoes. You would let the mosquito bite you, give you all of its toxins, infect you with East Nile virus, West Nile virus, and AIDS, and then you would blow it up. Well, those things weren't around when I was a kid, but yeah, we would, we would, <laughs> and then we'd blow it up. Yeah, that's, that's what, that's, that's, okay, good, good. I think we've established, I didn't it's, have. It's like peeling an onion with you, Graham. Yeah, we, we know for certain I did not have a s stable, regular <laughs> childhood. Like we know this, this is a. This... Most of your, most of your guardianship was mosquito based. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had a mosquito-based guardianship. Yeah, that was um, that's great. I was a ward of the state under the mosquitoes. Yeah, it was cool, man. Um, good, good. It, yeah, it's amazing. I didn't become a super criminal, criminal like a super villain. Like that's um, might be the Superman curl. Maybe that's what kept you on the other side. It did it really did. And watching all those cop shows growing up where this, the good guys won and the bat, you know, that it was, I was watching cop shows and superhero stuff and reading Batman. That's what did it. And little did you know that uh, the cops are 80% of the time the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> I might've shot low with 80%, but that was very generous. Lee, that was yeah, very, that was very generous. gracious. 80%. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. X. Bam. Uh, yeah, you can yep X. You can email me at uh, leecampmail at gmail.com. It's probably the best place. Yeah. Um, I saw the movie Civil War last night. Uh, I, I'm unfamiliar. Did, did this just come out? Yes, it came out last Friday on the 12th. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty on point depiction of what a civil war in America would be. It's fictional. Um, but it's, oh, it's like modern day civil war. Yeah. Oh, that sounds rough. Yeah. It's, it's, is this, is this like Trump's trial? He gets convicted and then. No, it's a completely fictional. It's not like Trump or Biden or president. It's a fictional president. It's in a near future, you know, it's, uh, um, what's his name? Offerman from, from the office plays, uh, the president. And they keep it sort of deliberately vague about there's the Florida Alliance or the, the Western forces and the floor. And, and you just, it's, they keep it vague as to who's on, but it, it shows what would happen in an American civil war to, in today, in today, if it would happen today, it wouldn't be like North versus South or it would be this fractionalized crazy, you True, know, but I, I assume this wouldn't make for a good movie, but, Whichever side had the U.S. military would <laughs> obliterate the other side. Well, that's the point. And that's what this movie shows. And this is why I think this is actually very accurate, because okay. think about it. Every state has a National Guard. So if some states aligned and took their National Guard, but which they, they don't have access to the 
like if they left the Pentagon, they wouldn't have access to all their weapons, would they? Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing you got to understand, Lee. Okay. In California right now, in Texas right now, is a military bigger than 90% of the world's militaries. So if these National Guards got together, they could go up with the actual United States Army and it would be pretty brutal. Like it would be, we have a bunch of small- I, I, I hear you. I feel like the Pentagon would just change their key code and then- <laughs> And then Texas National Guard would have no more guns that, that actually fire. <laughs> but what do you th they are, I'm, 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 I'm just joking around, but they, yeah, I, I like. They don't have to it, fly it, to D.C. to get their weapons out of a big, like, cabinet. No, no, no. I'm saying you just change the key code at, at, at headquarters and then, and then they pull the trigger and nothing comes out. I'm not saying that's how it works, but it's how it should work, probably. <laughs> Well, after you watch this movie, you go, wow, we probably should have that work because I know that our, our Pentagon is so pathetic that like as of five years ago, they still had nuclear codes like on floppy disk. Probably. Um, and then this movie also shows with everybody owning guns and all of these people who have served have some type of military training, then they would just create all of these little factions and regional, you know, beefs would pop up and and. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, um, yeah, it's, it's, this is how it, I mean, look right now. So the border thing in Texas, 12 states have lined up. This is the news isn't really covering this, but 12 states have lined up with Texas and, and Biden sent federal troops down there. So now the Texas national guard and all these other states are sort of looking to lock horns with the federal government. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it stars Ryan Gosling and who? <laughs> I Lee, I don't know if you're <laughs> I, I don't know if you're deliberately not taking this seriously or <laughs> you're just I don't like like you we both live in the country where like this could happen at any moment. It feels like maybe <laughs> uh I mean I don't I don't doubt some bloody shit could happen at any moment. I I, I'd have to read more on how much power would a state national guard have like mil like military might. Yeah. You might have men and they might have guns, but. Each national much... guard has tanks, helicopters, high grade weaponry. Each state has this in their state right now. Okay. Yeah. So it would be awful. <laughs> it's, uh, the rest um, of the, well, look at the, here's the bright side, Graham. The rest of the world would be cheering that they, they that the the storm drippers were all killing themselves. <laughs> absolutely, I mean that's absolutely like that's the other thing that this movie doesn't delve into. It really just shows like what it's like on the, what it would be like on the streets and what you know. It's pretty good depiction of like combat footage. It doesn't delve into what the international implications would be. I was sitting in the theater going, well we would then our, our financial systems would be down and collapsing. So then we would have no financial might. And I think the rest of the world would just go walk away and just let us kill each other and just go by and just like, yeah, this is your problem. It's kind of like when a prison filled with the worst of the worst, they all start stabbing each other and they're like, yeah. eh. hmm. we'll just, We'll just we, come by in a couple we, days when we, yeah, when we all just, the yelling stops. We just let this pan out, which is funny. I bring that up because my topic is uh, basically prison abolition or close to it. Oh, well, let's get into our first segment. <laughs> first segment for government secrets, prison abolition after a, dis after a thrilling discussion about an actual civil war based on a movie. <laughs> all right. I want you to keep in mind. We spent 15 minutes. Uh, uh, chit chatting because I don't I don't want that coming out of my time later. <laughs> Not my fault. Your uh, understanding about National Guard's armament, I think, should come out of your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I so this is why this is a government secret. This is a little bit different than topics I normally do, uh, but this is why it's a government secret is because we so rarely, it's almost never mentioned on mainstream media. Talk about the fact that the U S has the largest prison state in the world. We are the largest prison state 
in the world. Yes. And both per number and per uh, capita. Uh, and and uh, I'd done a segment before on like, it was like a dozen insane facts about prisons that you didn't know. But this is different. This is, I want to spend a little time going through what makes up, like what kind of crimes make up our prison industrial complex, why people are locked up. And then as a kind of thought experiment, let's see if we can get that number down to something more reasonable, you know, like, uh, like, like zero or like one, like one dude, one really awful dude, you know? Oh, this sounds dumb. Are you ready for this? Yes, Lee. I'm so I'm so ready for this. Well, well, at any point you can tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so immediately, whenever you bring up the concept of prison abolition or anything close to it, people immediately go, "But what about the murderers and the rapists?" Which is a weird thing to yell at someone. Like, just stop, just stop yelling that at me. But. Secondly, uh, I yell at you when I just see you like coming out of a coffee shop. I'm like, what about the murderers and rapists league camp? And you're like, I just have a latte. That was what you said to me last time we met up. Uh, <laughs> but let's put them aside for a minute. We'll, we'll get to them a little later. So first off, 2.3 million people, roughly. Thank you, Alex, for the donation. Love you, buddy. Uh, 2.3 million people in prison on average, at any given time in America. So let's start off by talking about the number that are not yet convicted. 470,000 of those held in American jails have not yet been convicted of anything. So this begs the question, what happened to innocent until proven guilty? Like, wasn't that something we used to have, the, just a thing we used to believe? So, all right, right off the bat, not yet guilty is need to be released. Isn't it though the reason they're in prison and they haven't been convicted is they're just kind of lazy and they haven't gone to court yet? Yeah, it's they often say they'll just ask a prisoner like do you want to go to court and they're like eh, next week and yeah, totally. Okay, a lot of laziness. Okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. So, just right off the bat we're releasing the not yet guilties cuz that's a thing we used to believe in at one point. Uh so we just got rid of a half million prisoners out of the prison industrial complex. Nice. Well done, everybody. Uh, so next up, drug offenders. 328,000 of those in U.S. prisons are convicted drug offenders, and that's 18% of the prison population. We shouldn't have those people locked up because drug problems are a health issue, not a crime issue. And pr prisons really only have two main goals, right? If you think about it logically. The goals of a prison are rehabilitation or punishment. If rehabilitation is your directive or your goal, then drug offenders should be sent to like rehab centers, right? To get better, not cages. If punishment is your goal, goal, then drug offenders don't need to be punished because they're already being punished. Isn't that what we're taught? That drugs are already, they, like they you harm yourself with drugs. That's what we're told growing up. So if they're already harming themselves... You don't need to harm them more. You know, it'd be like going up to a cutter and just being like, you suck, and then spraying lemon juice on them. Like that, it's just not and cool. And then setting them to jail. And you cut yourself, you're going to jail. Yeah. And setting them to prison. So well, hold on, let me just be the conservative voice. So you just want drug addicts to run wild on the street shooting heroin into babies or whatever they're... Listen, conservative with a, some sort of lisp. Uh, I am getting to that. Okay, just give me a second. <laughs> I didn't realize my character had a lisp, but all right. <laughs> so some people then immediately go, drug users uh, do harm to others, right? Not just themselves. They do harm to others. They steal stuff. They break stuff. That's what, basically what you just said. Well, even if that were true, those activities are already illegal. Right. Like arrest him for the illegal things. If they're, right. if they're stealing and shit, just you can get them for that. You don't have to get them for drug use. Uh, and for the drug offenders who aren't committing crimes, well, they didn't commit a crime, so don't arrest them. Right. Uh, and then back to this issue, you bring up a great point. If if drug use was treated as a health issue and not a criminal issue, 
then maybe the drug users would be getting the help with their addiction rather yep. than having to commit crimes to pay for their dr illegal drug habit. Yeah. We would be it's getting almost on. like it's a vicious cycle. It's almost like it's deliberate to make a private prison industry profitable. Anyway, I'm saying crazy. Things. Whoa, whoa. What, uh, what, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, yeah, combined the, the profit of private prisons combined with the fact that, uh, your American elite want to be able to arrest black people and people who are not white. And yes, they, the, the amount of drug use, according to all statistics is equal among black communities and white communities, for example. Uh, but black people account far more of those who are arrested for doing drugs because we have a racist policing system, but. All right, so you, 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 the, for those who aren't doing anything illegal other than doing drugs, you shouldn't arrest them because they aren't doing anything illegal. Um, and then people go, oh, but they're harming themselves. That's why we have to arrest them. They're harming themselves. But isn't our right to harm ourselves? Like, isn't that what freedom is? I mean, I wake up every morning thinking of new ways to harm myself, whether it be whiskey or amateur rugby. You know, I just... For for I know Graham, you're into bungee jumping and diving with sharks and unprotected sex. Like that's all <laughs> you do, and so you arm yourself all day, all day long. So that's like that's what being an American is. Uh, yes, it is. And if I want to let a mosquito get on my bicep and then I flex until it explodes, <laughs> there you go. Am I should I be locked up for murder? If, if Graham's dying for some West Nile, then let him have it. <laughs> Why it's my right to have it's West right. Nile while I'm having unprotected sex. <laughs> <laughs> your view of my life is amazing. <laughs> I mean, come on. I think I nailed it. So we, it's, it's, it's bungee jumping at 8 a.m., unprotected sex at 10 a.m., and then a green smoothie. And then sharks, and then and I then fight sharks. sharks or whatever. And then yeah. Sharks, yeah. Uh, and just to go back to the drug addict steal thing, do they really steal any more than Wall Street does? Like, oh God, of course yeah. not. You got investment bankers, the just crazy amount of thieving from your average American citizen, uh, and yet it's it's only drug people we go after, right. uh, comparatively. And then people also say, well, drug doers harm the social fabric, right? They ruin our community. Even if that were true, which I don't think it is, all kinds of people hurt the social fabric of our communities. You got polluters, bankers, lobbyists, bad drivers, dudes with no necks playing Creed real loud out of their car. The list goes on and on and on. So we don't arrest any of them for any of those things. So why just drugs? <laughs> We should have a separate like prison just for the loud creed players. You know what I mean? Like those guys that, that I'm down with <laughs> seven to 10, lock them up. <laughs> exactly. All right. So we just feel, we just freed all the drug users uh, or we sent them to rehab or whatever. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yep. X. Love yep -X. Um, says the, the message failed to go through a few times. Uh, yep, I don't know why the message would fail to go through. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. And look, I've, we've had this before where some people can like, they can super chat on my channel, but not yours or on yours, but not mine. I have no idea. I was demonetized for two and a half years. I know, I have no, I don't know. It's a mystery. Uh, you, you know what happened to, just happened to me a couple of weeks ago is my channel was growing really big. And then they, they didn't demonetize it. They just, everything shut down. It went, ah. you know, I, I've been cut to like 10% of what I was doing. Of course. Yep. They caught, they, they caught it. Whoops. He's they, doing well. They, they caught it. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, Oh shit. What is this? Ooh, get rid of that. Shut that down. Um, okay. So then people immediately jumped to what about drug dealers? Right. That's where you go next. Well, if drugs were decriminalized, drug dealing wouldn't be nearly as brutal. It wouldn't be this crazy killing game that we have across this country. Uh, and then, of course, what's the most harmful drug in the country right now by amount of damage done? 
is, well, maybe opioids, but second to that, alcohol by a mile. So yeah. therefore, one could argue the most harmful drug dealers are those serving alcohol. But here's the thing. I and and I I know Graham, you're you're just a better person than me and you're sober, but I'm a fan of alcohol and I'm a fan of anyone who deals with me alcohol. So those people are my friends. Like, so on behalf of them, I say drug dealers are rocking. They're awesome. They're good people. So <laughs> Well, it's also the cornerstone of our business as stand-up comics is selling alcohol. I mean, yeah. it's like... Yeah, yeah. That's how they make the money at the clubs. Yeah. yeah. All right. So all the nonviolent drug offenders, we just freed them all. At this point in the experiment, we've already released, of this thought experiment, we've already released 34% of all American prisoners. Next up, nonviolent property crimes, burglary, robbery, theft, fraud, essentially the stuff teens do on a good, you know, fun Saturday night. Oh, uh, I did that. It was great. And I did, I did that in high there, school. There yeah. you go. One, one arm, you were, you were stealing candy from a shop. The other arm, killing mosquitoes with your bicep. I like it. It was a two armed, two armed game. <laughs> yep. That's what I was doing. <laughs> but so, uh, but you know, when you think about burglary, burglary, theft, and fraud, first of all, it's the American way. The entirety of Wall Street is based on this. In fact, it's an open secret that the stock market is the dictionary definition of a Ponzi scheme. It's a giant fraud to extract wealth from the uh, from the not so rich and give it put it into the hands of the rich. And then, of course, there's trillions of tax trillions in tax havens, trillions of dollars of wage theft. Uh, sweetheart deals, insider trading, funny math, tax loopholes, greased palms, shell companies, exaggerated numbers, golden parachutes, probably some golden showers too. Like it's insane the amount of theft and fraud that goes on. None of it gets arrested or thrown in prison, you know? So it's just what, ridiculous. What is, what is the stock symbol for the golden showers? <laughs> GLD. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's gld and then an s that's a dollar sign ah oh, that's oh my god that's my rap name golden showers y'all um so the property criminals or the street criminals in prison constitute like a rounding error compared to the breathtaking theft that goes on by the rich most of it legally because our laws have been passed by, guess what, the rich. What? So, and even the police in this country uh, steal more nowadays than street criminals do because they steal it using civil asset forfeiture. And so cops are stealing more than average people. Well, in Chicago, and, you always just knew that the, you, was, you always wanted to be friends with a cop because they had the best weed. Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Although, did they, they, they did they share it with you? I feel like they probably didn't. It depends on which cop, you know. <laughs> uh, also, we should consider the fact that if we ended inequality by changing our socio not socioeconomic system, then there'd be little to no theft. But you know, side side note. Nah, why do we do that? Why do we need to even think about that? Yeah. So, all right, that's another four hundred and forty six thousand prisoners that were just released. And yes, you could still have punishment for the asshole who breaks into your apartment and takes your whatever, you know, Graham takes your uh, signed Jackass the movie poster. Uh, you could still have punishment. I know you worship that thing, but I, I have a Buddhist hanging right here, friend. And then I have the end, the movie poster for the endless summer. I do not have a signed poster from Jackass the movie. <laughs> that I take, I take great umbrage at that, Mister Camp. That you would. <laughs> That's the first thing I've said about your life that you've been unhappy with. Uh... All the other stuff is fine. <laughs> Unprotected sex, fighting sharks, whatever other crazy shit you think I'm doing. But it, in your list of things you have, you forgot to mention the nunchucks under your pillow. <laughs> I do have nunchucks under my pillow. <laughs> um, try breaking into my house in the middle of the night, motherfucker. I got something for you. I have something <laughs> for you. Um, but I do not have a jackass poster. <laughs> Thank you, Cyborg Ninja. Yes. Boom. Pow. Uh, and Cyborg Ninja throws that in right as we're talking about nunchucks. That was perfect. <laughs>
Anyway, the point is you could still have something for petty thieves, but it'd be like, you know, some community service. They have to sponge pay the elderly or clean out the sewer pipes or whatever. Something no one wants to do. <laughs> Your they solutions have to, are insane. They have, they have to sit on Graham's back while he does his one-arm push-ups or whatever. Just something. Something, something. like that. Uh, and... And there again, we just we just freed another half a million people, and and we got workers to help out the community for uh, the sponge right. bathing the elderly and all that for free. Uh, so there you go. And I, okay. we should add this too: if you if you do these programs right, where they're actually doing community service, a lot of those programs, if done correctly, um, really diminish recidivism because it's like they meet the victims they've hurt, they clean up in their community and they, they feel like less of an outsider that has to commit a crime. So. Yes. Thank you again, Alex. Love you, buddy. Boom. Um, okay. So at this point in this thought experiment, we only have, we only have, uh, I think it's a million people left in the, in the prisons. Uh, of those, there's 44,000 juveniles locked up. Almost none of them for truly awful behavior. 61% of underage prisoners are in jail for truancy or things like being, this is a direct quote, ungovernable, uh, whatever the fuck that means. Uh, you know, running away, small crimes like vandalism. And the U.S. is one of the very few countries that even locks up kids for any kind of real amount of time. So, like, here's an idea. Let's get a grip. Uh, let's behave like adults and let's, I believe the legal term is stop this shit. Um, and we could, we could still have places where troubled youth go for help, but it doesn't need to be the goddamn prison. Like if I, we really go ahead. I, I just, yeah, I, I just, just knock it off. I, I, that voice that you're talking about, I really think this cup, this country needs a leader that's sensible and has a solid dad voice. And it's just like, knock the cr knock this shit off. And like when yeah. somebody yeah. screams their dumb debate thing, so you just want the cops to have squirt guns? No, that's not what I'm, that's ridiculous and stupid. Shut it up. Or, you know, just <laughs> shut enough. It, shut it down. Yeah. Shut it down. You're, you're, you're preposterous. That's a stupid thing. And you know, it's dumb. You're just saying inflammatory stuff to get clicks on this dumb debate stage. Next question. And just like, wow, people would respond to that, I think. Yeah, I think people would love that. Um, all right, so we let the children go for, uh, go free. Next, the U.S. has somewhere around, it varies year to year, but 60,000 people locked up in immigration detention facilities, which is also ridiculous. Locking people up because they crossed a line in a field that you told them not to. Like, what are you, 12? Are you playing tag? Is the floor lava? Jesus, grow up. Yeah. Not to mention, we wouldn't have so many immigrants if we didn't destroy their home countries with CIA coups and economic warfare. So if we stopped that, then we wouldn't have nearly this number of refugees and migrants. And if we aren't going to stop that shit, then it's not really, we, we can't blame them for trying right. to flee the shit storms we're creating. Yeah. Between the juveniles and the immigrants, we've just uh, we're, we're we're down to about nine hundred thousand prisoners left. The next two hundred and sixty six thousand are imprisoned for public order crimes. Here's the definition uh, from an online law site: Public order crimes are actions that do not conform to society's general ideas of normal social behavior and moral values. So right off the bat, I can tell you this is a load of bullshit, all right? Because what the hell are normal social behaviors? I find a lot of normal social behaviors awful, like putting little shoes on your tiny dumb dog or <laughs> spitting out chewing tobacco in public or owning three cars in a McMansion with a giant yard that requires 11 billion gallons of goddamn fresh water every day or the animal torture that goes on to create the meat for a taco bell mystery meat dorito loco taco there are loads there are, there's loads of stuff that's categorized as normal social behavior that is just repulsive 
<laughs> little shoes for your dumb dog has to be at the top of the list. <laughs> it, it absolutely should be. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and in the past, let's remember what was considered normal social behavior. Slavery, genocide against indigenous people was normal and sometimes rewarded financially. Marital rape was considered legal and still is in some states. Uh, slapping children across the face because they looked at you funny, marrying off your 13-year-old daughter to a strange man in exchange for a couple of goats. These were all normal social behavior yeah. at one point in our past. So I don't think I like normal social behaviors. No, I don't. I don't either. Yeah, And nowadays, yeah. most public order crimes, other than drug use, stem from prostitution, public drunkenness, and paraphilia. All right, we'll get to that one in a second. On any given night in America, scores of people are publicly drunk to some extent. It should only become criminal if they do something criminal. Like, just because they're stumbling is not a crime, if they beat someone up or they steal something, then that's the crime, right. kind of similar to drug use. You don't have to get them for public drunkenness. So so you, you, you can get rid of the law against public drunkenness. I've known drunks that I'd like to be around a thousand times more than a stone sober Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Howie Mandel, you know, the three horsemen of the apocalypse. Howie Mandel, how did he figure into this? Is he running for office of the ball dipshit party or what? What? Uh... Well, I hated him before he decided to be a uh, a pro genocide Israeli supporter. Oh, but... yeah. he's an idiot. Uh, all right, so next you got prostitution. Prostitution is often, let's face it, a deal between two consenting adults legalize it, make sure it's not abusive, and then everyone benefits. I'm not saying we need to have it like readily available out in the middle of a public jungle gym on a Sunday afternoon, but if somewhere people, you know, just, just put it somewhere people don't have to stare at it and their kids, you know, don't see it on the way home from the ballpark, put it inside like a <laughs> edible arrangement shop. No one's going in there, you know? Just Is there it. currently some... Um prostitution jungle gyms out there that we're that i don't know there's only a few graham and i know you have them marked on your map i feel like you haven't gotten a lot of sleep the last couple of days and that's where these rants are like they're great rants but like something else is going on here because this rant is like am, am i not making some great points here you're making great points but they're right. they're a little there's some crazy shit in here. Like, there's some real serious. Like, I support everything you're saying, but I'm like, is everything else okay? Because this feels like one of my, I ran out of vegan protein powder and the yoga studio was closed. So I'm going to get really <laughs> mad kind of thing. I will say this day has been, uh, <laughs> this day has been difficult. My two year old uh, had, had like his first diarrhea and he did it like twice. Uh, in like a, a fire hose manner. And, and he didn't, he skipped the little leagues. He went straight, he went pro just like straight out of high school. It was okay. Crazy. So that now we're getting at the root of this. Uh, <laughs> not that you, you're making great points and I totally support what you're saying, but there's, I knew there was something else. <laughs> Bubbling under the surface. There was something else happening. <laughs> Listen, I told you, you're allowed to argue with any of these points. So far, so far, the only thing you've asked is whether there is jungle gym prostitution at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just a point of order. That's all. Point, it of, order. Is. point, point of order. order. Point, point, point of order. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then there's paraphilia, which I had to look up what it was. And it's unusual sexual behavior like voyeurism or masturbating in public. Now, first of all, for the truly strange people out there, let's be honest, all men. So we're talking men <laughs> partaking in these weird behaviors. Mental health care is what's needed, not a jail cell. Right. Like if you're caught humping a you know post office box and while yelling, Richard Nixon is a bad man, or whatever it is you do, then 
prison is not going to help that. Like, it's not going to fix it. And let's be honest, the mailbox shouldn't be all sexy, looking all sexy like that. I mean, why is it dressed like that? Why is it dressed like that? Like, like, great point. Great point of order, Graham. Great point of order. (laughs) Don't dress them like that. This feels like, did you get two hours of sleep and you've had like nine cups of coffee? That's, that's, and then the diarrhea thing happened. Like, that's what this feels like. (laughs) I still stand by that you have not argued with a single point. Your points are great. I just, uh, somebody humping a mailbox and yelling out Richard Nixon, that is a combination that a a sane brain, an unstressed brain probably wouldn't make, connect those dots. That's all I'm saying. When we started this podcast, I never argued I would have a sane brain, okay? No one ever said that. It wasn't in the contract. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so point is, if you have to do this kinky shit, you need like a team of counselors. You don't yeah. need prison. You need you need other kinds of help. And, and if you're on. jacking off, and if you and if you're jacking off in public, yeah, you could use someone to talk to. But you know, as long as you aren't leaving puddles, I don't even really see the problem. And in Sweden, they actually did. The Swedish court ruled, like a few years ago, that it's legal to masturbate in public as long as you aren't aiming it at someone specific. <laughs> See, that's a law I can get behind. You know what I mean? <laughs> just don't shoot your load my way and we're good, brother. It's all just, just aim it a bit to the right. And no, yeah. no brothels near the jungle gym and don't shoot your load directly at me. And we got a good, we got a good society function. That's right the there. entire, get rid of all our laws. Just have <laughs> that right there. That solves everyone's problem right there. That solves every problem right there. All right, so we're now down to uh, we're down to six hundred eighty thousand inmates. Okay, basically all that remains now is violent crimes. Now let's put rapists rab- and murderers aside for a second. We're we're looking at three hundred fifteen thousand inmates who are locked up for violence that isn't murder, rape, or sexual assault. Meaning there is uh, m- meaning it's probably it's almost all standard assault. Right now, there should be punishments for fighting and any form of like domestic violence and stuff sure. like that. I won't deny assault can be serious. It can be a serious thing, especially if your if your hands are weapons like Graham. But when you when you lock someone up for years for punching a guy in a bar brawl, you just turn him into like a more efficient, angrier dickhead. You basically send him to criminal university <laughs> free of charge. You know, and, and ruined his life, ruined whatever life he had going at the same time. So he comes out and generally has nothing or doesn't have much. And it's just so many reasons. It's a terrible idea. And you've actually torn the social fabric more than the so-called criminal did by punching someone. Right. So, sure, there should be punishments for assault. But, you know, just make it like a really boring anger management the meet, you know, meeting every Sunday or like, just get creative with it, whatever, just make them do stupid shit. But I'm saying like, there's no reason it needs to be prison. Uh, if it, if it, we're not talking, we're not talking murder or rape, but so just like that, we're down to 365,000 remaining prisoners in America. The next step is to decrease the insane sentences, uh, so that even violent criminals, uh, receive rehabilitation rather than just solitary confinement for 60 years. Pretty soon, with all these numbers decreasing, the U.S. would have the same number of prisoners per capita as, wait for it, other countries. (laughs) What? Wouldn't that be crazy? We'd be like other sane people. We wouldn't need... We wouldn't need large-scale penitentiaries penitentiaries because assuming we had roughly 100,000 prisoners left... We could send a few. So you got, let's say you got a hundred thousand rape, rapers, ra- rapists, murderers, uh, just awful human beings. You could send a few to each city in the United States and not even have ma- not even have major prisons. We have twenty thousand cities in the United States, so you'd have five prisoners a city, and you just have it. Just be a little house. You'd have a little house in each city. One adorable oh. tiny house with a few murderers and a rapist, and a couple of the murderers probably murder each other. So then you only have three. 
three people in a little house in each city. And that's it. You know, prison, prison abolition is not a crazy idea. It should, it should be a real goal of an evolved species rather than like this insane, crazy person thing that someone thought of once. Well, the one flaw in your argument is the two words you just said, evolved species. And that is not, <laughs> that is not the, the human race in general. Dep the, the United States is the, is the most devolved of the human species. So it's not going to happen. I, I, I totally agree. But let's also remember that at a certain time in our history, slavery was viewed as normal and uh, was legal. Yes. And even during that time, there were a lot of people who said we should not be doing this. Yeah. So things can change. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. That was a fantastic segment, Lee Camp. Outstanding. Um, now we're going to do Shagrit Nebra 2 when the CIA framed the Green Berets in Vietnam. Um, so this is a, actually was a, was a pretty, um, it's a little bit of a government secret because I've never heard of it, but it, at the time it was actually a big news story. Um, so there's a book, uh, called those gallant men on trial in Vietnam. It's a hardcover book and it's from the writer, um, John S. Barry, who was the military attorney for the a key defendant in the Green Beret case. This is one of the few books available on the strategy and it talks about the dynamic and litigation, the po political machinations between the US Army, the CIA and the Green Berets during the Vietnam War. So that's the book that uh, I'm referencing here, uh, those gallant men. But then I went to Wikipedia. So to give a little backstory here, um, this was the, the Green Berets were part of uh, Project Gamma, uh, which was the name given in 1968 to Detachment B-57, Company E Special Operations um, in Vietnam from 1967 to 1970. It was responsible for covert intelligence collection operations in Cambodia. The teams were highly effective in locating Viet Cong operations in Cambodia, <clears throat> leading to their destruction. When assets began to disappear, they identified a South Vietnamese officer as a mole on the advice of the CIA, they took extrajudicial steps and murdered him. Seven officers and one non-commissioned officer were arrested and tried. Um, so basically just to give a little backstory, uh, for people who might not know this about Vietnam. So, um, we had certain rules of engagement where we couldn't cross into like, um, Cambodia and Laos. And yeah, we um, stuck to that, right? Yeah, to totally. Um, <laughs> that's so, why that's why all of Cambodia was never touched by the uh, Vietnam War. No, we've never discussed uh, the the minefields in Cambodia and how we helped create the Khmer Rouge. No, not at all. Um, but one of the things that was happening was the v the Vietnamese knew this and then would would stack um, divisions on the Cambodian border who would then just like flood in across the Vietnam, right? So that's why we were like, oh, we have to do something about that. Even though then we sent these elite, you know, these illegal missions, which is just like, so the Green Berets would go in there. They would go into these, which would uh, oftentimes would, they would go in what was called sterile, meaning they would have no insignias, no dog tags. So if they got caught or killed or whatever, they, no one could say, oh, these are American soldiers. Right. Just, they would deny all involvement. Right. Yeah. Oh, these are just mercenaries. These are just, it's, it's just a tourist American who decided to sneak into Laos. <laughs> I mean, a lot of tourists just uh, go with military grade equipment. They, and they, they often just like to arm up and just wander around Laos during yeah. a Vietnam war. It was funny. After I saw the movie Civil War last night, it it triggered a lot of stuff of being in war zones. And I called uh, one of the comics. I went over there with Shane Matosh and we were in Afghanistan together and we went on kind of a crazy tour and we were talking about that last night. And she brought up a funny story. We were in, I think, a base in Kandahar and some of those bases are a little bit bigger. And so they had like a hair place you could get your hair cut. And we were just there waiting to like get haircuts. She was going to get a haircut. I can't remember what it is. And we're just laughing and joking and we're in civilian clothes. And somebody clearly worked for like the department of defense was like, 
I'm sorry. Um, they, they were, everyone was looking at, they could, we had no insignias. We weren't the press. We weren't, we didn't work for the department of defense. They couldn't figure out who right. we were. What the hell were, are you? What, yeah. What the hell were you? You know? And then we're like laughing. We're just being comics on the road, just riffing and laughing. And this one woman goes, can I ask, what are you guys here for? And I just dead face said, oh, we're here on our honeymoon. And <laughs> <laughs> this woman like, we're in, we're in Kabul on our honeymoon. <laughs> fucking Kabul. She just, her face went fucking white. She was like, huh? And Shama just good riffing comic jumped in and she goes, yeah, it's great. I mean, the nail, you know, nails here are like $5. This has cost me 30 bucks in the state. <laughs> It's great. We start listing all the cheap stuff there. I'm like, this is a blab. I mean, it's we're have looking. You the, have you had the pina colada next door? It's so good. And I said, we're looking at property uh, just outside of town. And this... <laughs> how long did you? How long did you keep this up for? And then finally, we both just started laughing. And this woman was like, "What?" We're like, "We're the comedians. We're doing." This. They're like, "Oh, we're doing." <laughs> we point. There was like a poster up or whatever. We're like, "That. That's us. We're doing that show tomorrow night or whatever the thing was." And. So. It's it's actually where people are forced to honeymoon in the witness protection program. <laughs> They're sent to Kabul. Well, it's part of your community service thing with your uh, <laughs> abolishing the prisons. We got they were yeah. like, "You guys want to do five years hard time, or do you want to have a honeymoon in Kabul?" And we're like, yeah. I'm in "Kabul, let's go." I'm yeah, let's just, we'll just take the Kabul thing. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have like uh, a room with a big bath, like a big bath? Is it one of those all inclusive things that were, yeah, you can go to the mess hall. It's all, all the meals you can eat. Oh, I'm in. There you go. It's Is there any way to get the muffins delivered to our room in the morning? Um, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of important to us. Do we, can we get the rose bath, the rose petal bath? Like, like rose water, like a rose water spray. They have that gabool, obviously. Yeah. If it's a honey yeah. thing, they must have that in gabool. And they're like, no, but we can get you uh, 30 kilos of opium. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, yes, there was the military tourism going into Cambodia. Um, so this was part of Project Gamma. Um, the, let's see, um, on like February 1968, it was moved uh the project gamma was moved from Saigon to Natrang and received a designation of project gamma and in conjunction with other special forces units, such as project Delta, which I believe we've covered on this show. Um, they were special re reconnaissance projects, uh, named with a Greek letter and they were formed by us military assistance command during the Vietnam war to collect operational blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the teams did not report up the normal military chain of command. Members of Project Gamma were military, but they were only nominally under the chain of command of the uh, fifth SGA. Instead, they received operational orders from the CIA station chief in Saigon um, and through the agency's satellite office in Natrang. As a result, there was a rivalry and friction between Army General Creighton Abrams, senior officers, and the officers leading Gamma. Many of the best and brightest NCOs chose to go to the expanding special forces units rather than the conventional army. Um, politicians, U.S. politicians in Washington, D.C. had granted Cambodia and Laos protected status and U.S. troops were not uh, officially allowed to act, uh, go across the border. Um, as I said, the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, took advantage of this. So Project Gamma... Um, changed that situation. It was responsible for obtaining intelligence, targeting the North Vietnamese activities and camps in Cambodia, supporting both regular and irregular units of the People's Army of Vietnam. Colonel Robert P. Renault commanded a, a combined force of Green Berets and South Vietnamese commandos who entered neutral Cambodia to gather intelligence and destroy communist infiltration, transportation, blah, blah, blah. When Project Gamma identified a target that was too big for them to hit, B-52 bombers struck those sites in a technical violation of the guarantee of security of the U.S. gave to those neighboring countries. So we weren't allowed to go into those. And this is, this is again when uh, Nixon was in office. So he sanctioned the illegal bombing of Cambodia. This is, uh, and Laos. We, they, the, so these Project Gamma would go across the border and then say, oh, this is a communist camp or whatever. And then B-52s would bomb Cambodia and Laos, which we were technically not supposed to do. 
Um, so that's the, that's the setting where this happened. So they found out there was a mole in the unit and they, um, because this Dude, finding a mole on your unit is just like the worst. It's just, it'll ruin a weekend. Totally. Hey, do you mind sucking this mole off my unit? Um, and, uh, that's what they would say. So, yeah. uh, that's, that's, they're well known for saying that green berets. That's actually the green beret motto. It's on the flag. <laughs> So this project actually was was had huge operational success, and Comic Project Gamma used members of the Khmer Suri and Khmer Kampucha from activities inside Cambodia. The top intelligence officer on General Abrams' staff stated in eight, October 1968 that Project Gamma was providing 65 percent of the known data on the Provisional Army of Vietnam base camps and strengths in Cambodia, as well as 75% of the data in South Vietnam. Um, early in 1969, Detachment B-57 had developed into the finest and most productive intelligence collection operation the United States had in Southeast Asia. Um, so the this is when in early 69, some of the B-57 members uh, some of their assets, human sources of information started to disappear. The I lost my background. I'll figure it out. You, you, I lost my background. You keep going. I don't oh, know. Man. I don't know. What's man, happening. you're going to have to go to a virtual background. Like I had, this is, this is rough. These are rough days. My friend. Wow. Do you think some tax would help? <laughs> uh, no, no, I don't think they will. It really changes when you don't have a blue background. I it, I just don't I don't feel I'm I'm uh, as legitimate or as uh, loved. <laughs> yeah, you should feel there. It is. Oh, good. At least no. we'll, we'll 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 stick with that one for now. <laughs> yeah, I just I just want you to feel loved by your television. Um, <laughs> I just the nice warm radiation behind my head. <laughs> So in 1969, they they concluded that uh, its intelligence staff had been compromised by a mole. Um, in the spring of 69, the uh, reconnaissance team operating in Cambodia captured photos of Chu Van Tai Kok, a.k.a. Tai Chek Chai Kok Chin, a South Vietnamese gamma agent meeting with North Vietnamese intelligence officers. So they, they believe they found the mole. Sergeant Alvin Smith, who had been Chen Yin's handler identified Chen Chun Yin in the photos. Chun Yin was subsequently arrested and interrogated for 10 days. Polygraph tests uh, indicated that he was a double agent working with the Viet Cong. They also suspected that he had been informing the South Vietnamese government, which meant that they released him. The government uh, might project Chen and that he might walk free. Various ways of dealing with Chun Yin were discussed with Detachment B-57, including possibly killing him. While the 5th Special Forces Group Executive Officer strongly opposed killing him, the detachment's commander and operations officer met with the CIA headquarters in Saigon. The soldiers reported that the CIA suggested the elimination might be the best course of action. This but, is where... But, but, but then again, the CIA, before, they, before you even tell them what you're doing, they're like, I think you should probably kill him. You're like, we were talking about how I can't find a dog sitter. Yeah, yeah, I think you should probably kill him. Yeah, take him out. Just just take it out. Just a dog sitter? Answer. Yeah, kill them all. That's all right. <laughs> this is where the term came out. And so of of eliminate a uh, terminate with extreme prejudice, which is a term that is used um in the movie Apocalypse Now when Martin Sheen goes to meet with the colonels and Har and a young Harrison Ford, and there's this like He's not identified, but he's clearly CIA in the room. And they say, go terminate the colonel with extreme prejudice. That, that's then they're all like looking around like, what? Um, and what does extreme prejudice mean? It mean it, I don't know what, what, what the CIA came up with it, but it's like, go kill this son of a bitch. You know, that's that's their way of, of terminate with extreme prejudice is their way of saying, go kill this person. Extreme prejudice means just definitely do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really get mad. Get mad first. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's just crazy CIA, you know, murder speak or whatever. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and all this stuff came out then that were in the trial, um, which was widely broadcast. I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, the, on June 20th, 1969, three officers aside to Project Gamma drugged Chen, took him out on a boat into the Natan Trang Bay, shot him twice in the head. And they also shot him with morphine, which means he would bleed quicker. Um, they weighed his body down with chains and dumped his body into the Ch South China Sea. What in the flying fuck? What? That's Sh shot him full of morphine, then shot him in the head, then dumped him. Like, I think that's actually where the term overkill originated. That, uh, yeah. And I think that like, sounds like extreme prejudice. That sounds like really don't just shoot why him. Did they, why did they need him to bleed quicker? He's been shot in the head. He's pretty dead. I think that would mean the sharks would eat him quicker. Like if he's <laughs> bleeding more, I don't know. Nope. I can't Jesus. get inside the mind of the psychos. They're, the they're like, also, uh, paint his toenails pink. Just, it'll be embarrassing. Just do that, too. Just throw that in there. Uh, you know, just shave his eyebrows and uh, yeah. just pluck six of his pubes. Just, just. And just write pictures of dicks on his chest, you know? <laughs> what? Oh, God. So this is the CIA doing doing fantastic work. Um, they, uh, the, a cover story claimed that Chiyun had failed to return on a mission. And that was a test of his loyalty was later approved by the fifth special operations group. Sergeant Smith, Chinyan's handler was not a member of special forces, but an army intelligence specialist. Smith, Smith had failed to follow protocol when onboarding Chinyan and failed to require Chinyan to take a polygraph test that might've revealed that he had spoke fluent English was from North Vietnam and had family there and had worked for a number of U.S. outfits and left them all in turmoil. Um, the, the Smith, Sergeant Smith, uh, his handler, be, uh, was concerned for safety and sought sanctuary with the CIA in the Trang. The CIA alerted the Army's Criminal Investigation Division who granted him immunity. Smith revealed that Chunyan had been killed and identified the Green Berets involved. General Abrams was not a fan of airborne troops, particularly special forces. He quickly ordered all the officers uh, to be charged with premeditated murder. So the CIA orders this, and then these guys are charged. The trial um, was then covered extensively by the media. So did and the CIA order the Green Berets to do it? Or the CIA ordered someone else to do it? Uh, I, th I think they ordered somebody else to do it. Um, and then, they, but then the Green Berets were found guilty. Okay. Well, they were charged. They ended up. Or, or charged. Yeah. Yes. Um, so then this became known. This was in the news uh, here in the States as the Green Beret Affair. Um, information revealed during pretrial preparation revealed that the CIA had ordered Chin to be quote, terminated with extreme prejudice, which entered the public lexicon as a euphemism to execute, which yeah. then they used in, um, apocalypse now. Um, right. uh, state... I think they should have called this whole thing, the green berainment. <laughs> And put it on I, on cereal on a cereal. I, box. I don't know why they missed that. Coming up at eight o'clock, the Green Beretment. Um, the CIA issued a statement denying they knew of Chunian when the soldiers asked them for input, and that they strongly urged the Green Berets not to kill them. So they start lying that they didn't tell these guys to do this. And did anyone believe that the CIA? <laughs> It strongly encouraged anyone to not kill anyone. Yeah. <laughs> CIA was like, don't kill someone. We're just a bunch of office desk jockeys. Just don't do anything crazy. Just, you know. Um, Wait, listen, every time murdering someone comes up, I'm like, I don't think so. I always say that. Don't I always say that, Martha? I always say, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, the. Uh, Okay, the Army defense lawyers for the eight soldiers summoned General Abrams and CIA officials as witnesses, all refused to testify on the grounds of, guess what, Lee? National security. Um, there we go. So at this moment, this is when the author of the book, um, 
John S. Barry was brought in and he, uh, there's some interviews on YouTube you can watch um, where he was brought in to, to be one of the key defend, uh, to, to defend um, one of the key defendants. And they had what was called, I forget it's called like a, uh, a section 32 trial, I forget, but it, it, it basically is in the army. It's their grand jury. It's like the biggest type of trial you can have as, as, as if you're an active duty military. Um, he came in and he was like, wait a minute. And he got all of the attorneys for all of the green berets together and started seeing like, oh, the CIA totally colluded all of this, told them to do it, ordered them to do it, or, you know, ordered them to kill this guy with extreme prejudice and then said, we didn't do, we didn't tell the green berets to do that. Right. Even though the, the, the berets, right. the, the, right. the, the green berets commanding officer was like, this is not good. And they all were like, we shouldn't kill this guy. We should just put him on trial. And the CIA said, no, nope, kill him. And then they did it. And then they went to trial. <laughs> good old it's the CIA. Boy, have we ever done a story where the CIA sold out people that were working for them? Is that ever, have we ever, was that? No, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. No, that, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right. Doesn't sound right at all. It's very, it's very off brand for such a <laughs> good and upstanding citizens. It is off brand for the CIA. Um, so, uh, they had this trial, um, and this, uh, John Barry, the author, um, was on like interviewed by Walter Cronkite. He was interviewed by the New York times. And when you watch this, this video that was done of him, maybe, I don't know, in the last 10, 15 years of him recounting this, he talks about how the American people need to know. And it's one of those things that we've talked about before on this show. This is the last time the press was like somewhat free and doing its job and the press was like holding or, the CIA accountable. Yeah, or there, there. It wasn't necessarily entire outlets, but it was like there was a certain number of people at the LA Times or the New York Times right. or whatever who were, do, yeah, do, doing real work, holding people accountable. Uh, you know, Robert Shear is a good example, and but all these people were booted eventually. Yeah, I mean, we yeah we've talked about this like. Um, you know, what was it? Ben Bradley at the, uh, at the Washington post or Cronkite or these guys that were like, no man, this is journalism. We need to do this. We need to get the, yeah. you know, whatever the Pentagon papers or whatever. This was all in that time when it was like, we're holding our government accountable. And there was a huge public trial and people were like, didn't trust the CIA and everything. Yeah. And this is, this is now 69, 70. So you're talking about six, seven years after the the JFK assassination, which we've covered a lot on this show. Yeah. And it was like this, the seventies, like Watergate, this was the last era. And by the eighties, then the media all got bought up by massive corporations where it was much easier yeah. to just have a top down censorship or soft censorship. You know, when you, when you're owned by a massive conglomerate, it's very easy I mean, you and I know we've, we've, we've both been censored, um, in numerous ways. And we've talked about this before. Then you start self-censoring, you know, we've, we've had to do it. We've had to change, not put certain words and titles of videos we've done for government secrets and individually I've self-censored myself since I got my YouTube monetization back. I've totally pulled back on stuff. I've had to because what, what, what type of the things do you cut back on, uh, like well, uh, the word dingleberries, I don't say that as much. No, I've never used that word. Um, oh. um but I've uh, used I, I uh, can't say cock toast as much as I used to. <laughs> uh, nut fudge face, how about that one? Yeah, I've got to say, I got to find a euphemism for balls on chin. I gotta really. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, is it like uh, Epstein only once every two weeks or? Yeah, I don't talk about him as much. Um, I never put Israel in a title. I just say Middle you, East. You, you know, it, I think it might be the expression that I'm now facing, but Israel was not getting me suppressed for uh, 
several months after they began their special genocide operation. And yet now it seems like it probably is. Yeah. It's so, um, that's, that's when you watch this video and you see like, Oh, this was back when like actual journalism and actual, like, Oh, let's the, the, you know, the news media, a free press is, is supposed to want to be one of the checks and balances in, in a, de in a democracy. It's supposed to keep those in power, hold them in, you know, hold them, you know, hold them accountable. And that's, and that's yeah. what happened. So as a result, since the CIA wouldn't testify, um, when they refused to testify in September, 1969, secretary of the army, Stanley Reznor announced that all charges would be dropped against the eight soldiers. Since the CIA refused to make its personnel available as witnesses, making a fair trial impossible. So, and then project gamma was deactivated March 31st, uh, 31st of March, 1970. Um, and that was it. That was actually like, uh, and then the book was written in the nineties. And so these guys were actually acquitted because it was not their fault. They were ordered to do this, you know, terminate with extreme prejudice, but the CIA wouldn't admit fault and they wouldn't go on trial. So they just made the trial go away and say, these guys are acquitted. So that's the most I mean, amount of justice I mean, you're going to get. That, well, and it's and it's just more proof that the CIA is completely unaccountable to anybody. Anybody? Yeah. I mean, they weren't subpoenaed. Like you refused to testify. Like if you or I were involved in something, we would and they we, we had we would have to test. They would say if you don't right. testify, you're going right. to jail. Those are your choices: yep. testify or jail. And the CIA just is is accountable to no one. And and with the CIA, it's if you don't testify, we're gonna go like this. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna make an ugly face at you, mm -hmm. and you just have to you're gonna have to take that. And that's yep. and that's it. That's the end of the the ramifications. So I mean, the victory is at least these green berets weren't didn't have to go to jail for what the CIA did, and but the CIA was not held accountable. I mean, it was kind of a victory, and it got a lot of press. Which so now they never the so they never actually faced the green berainment. No, Lee, it was <laughs> not a green berainment. And I know it bums you out because you want to say green beraiment as many I times. I really wanted before. that to happen. I really, for all of us, I wanted that I for know, all of us. It's important. Green beraiment is very important. Um, <laughs> it's an important thing for all of us. Like, um, so that is the story of the CIA framing the green beret. <laughs> Woo! All right, folks. Uh, do we have an extra segment? Yes. Go on over to patreon.com slash government secrets. You can join for as little as $5 a month. You get like 60 some uh, bonus segments and we will be over there in a couple of minutes doing a, um, it's a great rate to support the show. It's the only where place you can get any government secrets merch. You can get this mug and you can get this as a sticker and you can get, I believe that on a t-shirt as well. So you're supporting the show, you're getting cool merch, and you're getting bonus GovSeeks. Patreon.com slash government secrets. Um, and yeah, I live stream four days a week. The, you can find all that at leecamp.com. And uh, I'll just, uh, for, for now, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I've been, since I've been back from El Salvador, I've been trying to do my uh, po political vigilante, but it's extremely depressing and I, and I'm, I, it's hard for me to do. So I'm trying to find some other stuff to talk about. I love doing this show. Does this, but... does this one, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, which is more depressing, this or the other one? Well, this isn't depressing because we just laugh. I mean, <laughs> even though it's depressing, we still laugh our asses off. So it's like, it's totally palpable where um, my other show, I don't, I trying to find positive subjects. I, I, I don't know. I was, I was in El Salvador for two months talking about Bitcoin and everything's hopeful down there. And then to come back where it's like, well, oh, Biden versus Trump again, and everything's awful. And, um, wait, is it all hopeful? Isn't there, aren't there a lot of issues in El Salvador? There are. Yes, there are. It, the country has a lot. It's, it's, you know, Bukele is having to deal with four to five decades of civil war and violence and poverty, but, stuff is actually being done. Like you're seeing 
it happened. Like I interviewed the minister of education and they're like, yeah, the schools have gotten better. They, everybody gets a tablet. They've put broadband in the schools. You're seeing roads getting built. You're seeing people getting better jobs. Like you're seeing it happen. You're like, there's a lot, they got a lot to, to deal with, but there's people down there spending money on projects. There's people building cool stuff. Salvadorians are like, feel, they feel the relief of not having the gangs. I don't, I don't know. We're doing stuff here. Just, just the other day here in Baltimore, they, they're, they announced they're really close to getting that bridge off of that boat. <laughs> so stuff's getting done here. I don't know what you're talking about, Graham. Yeah, I stand corrected. That's a great example of the America's uh, infrastructure and the money being spent not overseas on crazy wars, but on America and its people. Yeah. When they get the bridge off the boat, I actually haven't been watching. Maybe they already have, but when when it happens, we're we're gonna have a big party. It's gonna be like it's gonna be amazing. Are you guys gonna have a bridge off boat barbecue? <laughs> yeah, 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 bridge bridge off boat quinceanera. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I mean, go check out my show. I, I got to figure out something else to do because I I I'm trying to get sell this game show and do other stuff because I just it's it's depressing. I love this show, but my other stuff is hard to do. It's hard to do. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Um. But uh, we will. I am doing a lot of stand up stuff. So go to grandmelwood.com and uh, you know, tune in and have fun. All right, patreon.com slash government secrets. See you in a few minutes. Yes, this has been Government Secrets episode 156. CIA frames the Green Berets, and America's got great prisons. Later. Bye.